I think we'll make a start. Um, good day to you, everybody. My name is David Goodman. I'm the director of the China Studies Center here at the University of Sydney. And before we begin our meeting, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia, recognizing their continuing connection to the land, water and culture, and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, to our uh, bookworm series where members of the China Studies Center talk about their recent publications. Um, uh, uh, John Clark, who's Emeritus Professor of Fine Art here at the University, and his discussant, Yvonne Lowe, who's in the Department of Art. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Yvonne to introduce John, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from the speakers. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, David. Uh, it's so good to be here. I would also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Euroa nation upon whose ancestral lands I live and work. And I would like to, on this occasion, pay my respects to all Euroa elders, past, present and emerging. It is a real privilege to be here today and all the more so to have the honor of introducing our speaker who has been an incredible mentor to me all these years. John Clark is Emeritus Professor in Art History here at the University of Sydney, where he has taught for 22 years since 1992, uh, before he officially retired in 2013. A truly prolific intellectual and path-breaking scholar, in my view, in the field of Asian art, John is the author of six books and the editor or co-editor of five other. Many of his essays, I know for a fact, have become requisite readings for courses on Asian art history in tertiary institutions across the world. And his research has been widely acclaimed, for example, Asian modernities, Chinese and Thai art of the 1980s and 1990s, won the best art book prize of the Art Association of Australia and New Zealand in 2011. His latest book, The Asian Modern, launched early this year by the National Gallery of Singapore charts the development of art in Asia from the 1850s to the present day and will, I am sure, be an invaluable resource for the field in the years to come. The title of the talk today is where do we find Chinese contemporary art in the Asian modern trajectories of the national? Like everyone, I am very excited by what is to come. Um, but before I hand over to John, I would like to uh, just let everyone know that we will have some time at the end of the talk for questions. But please feel free to send through any questions that you may have um, in the Q&A box, not the chat box. So the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen anytime throughout the talk. It is with great pleasure now that I um, hand over to John. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging as I do to all the past, present and future traditional owners of Australia and pay them my deepest respect. This presentation is not really about the contemporary, it's about how our sense of contemporaneity began in China in the 1920s and 1930s and draws on several parts of the book, which you can see in front of you. The problem of national or culturally authentic shifts between objects and representatory code now becomes more acute in China if we look at artists in comparison elsewhere in Asia, although we won't have time to do that today, such as the contemporaries of Xu Bei Hong and Han Yuliang in the Philippines, such as Edades. The principal aim of the Chinese painter Xu Bei Hong during and after his visits to Japan in the 1910s and to Europe in the 1920s and 1930s was to reinvigorate Chinese painting by the infusion of what he thought was realist European painting. He was actually already prepared by his syntheses between uh, photographic mimeticism and certain kinds of Chinese representation, 
already before he went to Japan in his painting. Recently excavated by either Yuan, Yuan Wong in, uh, I think originally in a uh, auction catalog. Later, he extended this impulse to drawing in Chinese media, and sometimes he transferred mimetic realism to Chinese subjects done with Chinese media. It's useful to see how far his notion and practice of realism was, how far it was from current visual discourses in Europe that during the time he was there, and this hasn't been done by Chinese speakers as far as I know, and how the problem of the national was differently constructed by some leading European artists. Here, one can also keep in mind without over rigidly imposing it, the reconsiderations about the modern and contemporary put forward by Terry Smith in his recent works in 2019 being the latest. He identifies postmodernist thought as freed from the constraints of singular narratives, a retro sensationalism trending into the spectacular, and by a remodernism, that's to say, a conceptual reformulation and conscious display of modernist devices as the three bounding elements of contemporary art. Here, we have to think of Su as a pre-modernist opposed to the modern, as a kind of academic reactionary. And towards the particular issues this raised in China, in which he attempted to a realistic stylistic and practice to oppose in the name of a new national identity. Su was before all else unaware of the need to escape from singular narratives which is why his work was to be so acceptable to a kind of brute socialist realism later. To anticipate, we must always recall that the Chinese modern art he took to Paris, Moscow and elsewhere in 1933, subject of a recent very competent article by, um, um, I'll just read it, so I'll tell you, I like to foreground other contributions uh, by Stephanie Su, Exhibition as Art Historical Space, the 1933 Chinese Art Exhibition in Paris, the Art of Art Bulletin, September 2021. That this work, this, this exhibition in 1933, preceded oh, by only one year the proclamations of about socialist realism in Moscow, which were themselves the rigidification of existing currents in Soviet art ideology. Since the late 1920s. This is a complicated series of crossings with European art, which is followed by Xu. I think I'm on the way go. That's the right way. Xi Beihong studied for a while with Pascal Adolphe Jean Daniel Bouveret in France and with Arthur Kampf in Berlin, which we see on the screen. And he inherited visual techniques and subject matters from both. From Daniel Bouvier, he seems to have adopted a kind of Plowist visual ideal of the nobility of rural labor and the grandeur of the tools and animals used in everyday toil. This could affect the relative placement and scale of motifs in the picture frame from, ca from camp and also by him from the previous 19th century painter, Mental, these are heroic workers showing how close the subject matter and the drawing style are to count by Shibet. Um, this privilege of outline and ways of re representing the figure on in, uh, face on in portraits and, and self portraits um, was linked to a series of historical tableaux which supposed the grandeur of histor historic history painting. We think this to a folk vernacular, and you see that. Su Hong significantly avoids certain trajectories opened up by his European precursors. Here, this sort of, if you like, uh, I'm getting my screen sharing notice over the top of my dates, which is difficult. Uh, but you can see this certainly in a relationship between his historical paintings in 1859 61 and Su Bei Hong's very famous. Tian Hung and his 500 warriors in 1928-30. They are virtually the reverse, reverse the figure, the fig principle, the position of the position of the principal figure, and the same conceptual frame and ways of representing the 
historical person in use of some note. The difference between Pat Menzel and uh, Shibe Hong is, of course, that Shibe Hong didn't know the individuals that he represented, whereas Menzel was very close to the time of Frederick the Great, uh, as shown in this picture. So the European history painting is closer to real events than the models proposed and followed by Shibe Hong. And also this can be found in a very important picture of 1861 by Menzel, which um, Kampf borrowed. Shu appears not to have noticed the historical complexities from which this art arose. And the taste of patrons, including Adolf Hitler, who's um, on the oh, frog for these images from the establishment of the Prussian state, the allegoristic nature of those pictures, the kind of informal rough quality of the visual field and so on and so forth. And this was projected into the visualization of the Bismarckian state, which unified Germany in 1870 and affected the historical consciousness, consciousness which underlay 19th century reformulation. Of history paintings. We're not doing John uh, David's sort of historical painting. They were slightly, they were really quite different, actually. This was no real simple reworking of European neoclassicism, although Schumit might have been familiar with that through his exposure to the work of David during his um, time in Paris, presumably by the Louvre. Uh, the problem is that what was the consciousness of the artists who dealt with the history or historical events and how this affected their perception of themselves? The cardinal examples to be considered are Max Beckman, whose conversation was already in the Berlin Neue Gallery before Sue's arrival, although as far as I know, there's no record that he saw it, and Otto Dix, that's not on the right, which was his parent, these artists looked rather balefully at historical events before and during World War I. And it has to be remembered, Beckman served as a nursing orderly and Dix as an artilleryman. They had a direct experience of warfare, which was not available to Shube Hall. So they were trying to grasp aspects of the past and the close present, which they'd actually found themselves. Um, and this can also be found in, excuse me a minute, in, I'll go back to that, in um, his portraits of himself, which um, are my very much the romantic um, uh, thinking intellectual in the street, as it were, which were not those of, uh, in this case, Beckman, uh, who was more concerned with showing the intellectuals as a, as a pain wanderer through artistic life. And indeed, it must be remembered that Beckman had already painted this magnificent piece of critique, including the critique of, of course, the revolutionary figure on the right, a sort of um, anagram or visual anagram of Lenin in this picture of um, the night which has never been, as far as I know, illustrated in China. At least it's not part of the normal world of Beckman, which is presented to Chinese artists. Um, if we go on, as I've already started, to compare the various self-portraits by Xi and Beckman, uh, or Xi and Dix, this is Xi and Beckman here. Um, and we can go a bit further and see another picture, other pictures which compare the two. This is this is Su Chu and Dix on the right. Um, we find the series intentionally is not is intelligently pro -pro -pro probing his own self-image, but Chu is virtually unaware of being an artist caught between dilemmas about what it is to be modern and what forms one should use to represent this. Xu is thinking of himself as a representative intellectual of the crisis in modern Chinese consciousness, caught between the knowledge of what China might need to become modern, or reconstituted as morally cent central and therefore powerful, 
and what it meant to be an artist to use other than Chinese means and forms to represent that. One could only consider that Sue's turning away from the historical critical functions of the realism he espoused prevented him from the kind of self-inquiry undertaken by artists who were contemporary of his, in his during his sojourn in Germany in the early 1920s. In Shu's, uh, we see none of the ferocious questioning of social reality we see in uh, Beckman, for example. Here we have a famous picture of, um, which has been lost. But, um, I can't, I'm sorry, my screen sharing sign is overlapping my images here. I don't know how to get rid of it. I'll have to stop sharing in order to do that. So I just have to see that, presume that you can see the date, and I can't. <clears throat> this is an important consideration because one can only consider that Seuss, turning away from the historical criti critical functions of realism he espoused, prevented him from the kind of self inquiry undertaken by artists contemporary Jews in Germany. In Sousa, we see none of that ferocious questioning we see in Beckman and Dix. And this is all the more surprising because material for a Chinese critique of urban, even crumpled or westernized reality, which you see in these pictures of what I describe as Myanmar decadence, and simply simple, are easily available in China. The questioning does not really appear in Chinese painting. I'll show you examples from the 1980s. Whether in officially sanctioned depictions of peasants, as on the left, or in expressionist exertions against complex, the complex, commonplace, bourgeois moral complacency, which you see on the right, this artist I photographed in the Central Academy in 1989. So this indicates a whole range of problems the relationship to contemporary European painting, which is absent in Sue, and accounts for his hostility to modernism. And also to his excluding certain kinds of modernist tendencies from the 1929 first National Fine Arts Exhibition from whose committee she withdrew. Well, what's Sue's relationship to Arthur Kampf will that show any other light on it? Yeah, his obviously an academic mentor. Kampf was rector of the Hochschule für Bildende Kunst, the College of Fine Arts, from 1915 to 1924. Uh, but there's no exact direct evidence, other than Schu's recollections, that he actually took classes with or audited Kampf's teaching. That might be an unprom unpromising uh, avenue to go down if it were not for the fact that many of Schu's paintings strongly resemble the work of Camp either in technique, pose, or so forth. Here's two, a 1914 drawing by Xu done in India, and a painting done um, in the 1910s, I think, uh, by um, Arthur Camp. For draw the drawing technique is very, very similar. And actually, the posing of the subject is. She respected Kampf enough to buy two of his works on borrowed funds in 1922, but we cannot see what they are. They were because the Shibei Horn Commemorative Museum is not open to the public, or at least its archives are. And even the uh, uh, symposium I attended in 2013, where, where this work was discussed, and my drawing of these really parallels was, was actually agreed by the Chinese. <laughs> colleagues to the extent that they published it in a translation, um, that this, uh, these similarities are not part of common discourse in China, to say the very least. Here we see some work from Tian Han, we've already seen it, and it's fairly obvious that he, the way camp groups had studied in uh, historical record reconstruction groups are uh, the direct precursor of it. Um, well, what's going on here is, in fact, a new kind of historical, a search for models for a new kind of historical allegory. 
Um, fortunately, we can find some of these precursor models in, mod, uh, in um, historical uh, reproductions of work which was destroyed during the Second World War. That's one in Breslau, you can see there in front of you, uh, which is almost take away the figure, reverse the position, look at the gestures and so forth. It's almost a copy of it. No, no Chinese scholar, as far as I know, has mentioned this. It may be that they simply don't read German um, or haven't made the attempt to use a German-speaking person to find out for them. These, these, these illustrations are all available in reproductions of Camp's pictures from the 1920s. Uh, and so um, one has to presume that the, the, the inability to recognize this is um, motivated that there's some reason to exclude it from Chinese art historical discourse. Um, one may note the historical conflicts of a need to provide visual representation capable of grasping the sorry state of contemporary China and its citizens. We, and there seems to be certain kind of echoes with the physical and economic constraints of Weimar Germany, which Su himself had experienced. Did he read into his experiences of Berlin and German art a kind of Chinese sympathy for German revanchism after uh, revisionism? After World War I, did he choose not to identify with the radical confrontation of received forms and artist consciousness of Beckman and Dix, which were formed by the horrors of the war they experienced? I'm not sure. If the status of Camp in 1930s Germany is understood in China, but Camp, for lack of any better expression, sorry, I jumped too fast there, pressed the wrong button, zoom, zoom. Uh, big problem. Oh, this must have confused a few of you. Here we are. Um, Kampf was a Nazi artist. Kampf became a Nazi artist. He painted the overthrow of Weimar democracy in 1933 by Hitler and became one of the nine famous privileged painters of Hitler's life. Uh, he was a page patronage of Hitler. He was remarked, his work was remarked on in all of the German, that great German national exhibitions of painting, which accompanied um, the simultaneous um, denigration of modernism um, in Munich. Um, and um, all of this draws on his represent, representation of patriotic sentiments of the German people during the First World War. It's there, it's clear as a bell, I think. <laughs> Doesn't really, there's no way to argue about it. Um, and of course, um, Kampf was present when Xu Bei Hong exhibited his own work in 17th and 17th November of the, of, of, of the same year that Hitler was over, Hitler over to the, the um, uh, Weimar Republic. Uh, he, later, it was, it was, he, he, his exhibition opened on 17th of November. Camp was present, and Camp painted, I don't know the exact paint of the dating, dating of the painting, but it's certainly given as 1933, the overthrow of the Weimar Republic. Um, that's his Camp's picture on the left. Um, so you must surely be aware of all the implications of the nationalist expression of the preferred stars. Um, and one supposes he must have known about it since the early 1920s, but this is not clear. I mean, Xu had returned to China in the meantime and then went back with his exhibition in 1933. So, um, I mean, I don't suppose he was in, like, was it, was in sympathy with National Socialism, but it was certainly in sympathy with National Socialist type representation. I don't think he was even a closet Nazi, but artist, art historians must, must note the com confluence of a nationalist painting based on a projected cultural purity in the past, with the state propensity to use this contingency for its own ends. It foregrounds certain artists and their conveniently malleable styles towards a denial of modernism by an intoxication with national allegory, exactly what she was engaged in China. The state sanctioned conformity did not take place in, in China really until the 1950s. Despite the proto, despite, and I hear you have to say, despite the proto impressionist coloring, which was excluded by Xu from the 1929 exhibition, I think, when he 
withdrew, withdrew from the jury, um, he actually does it, practices himself in the 1930s. See that there. And also this sort of um, neo-impressionist, late um, romantic representation of the landscape. Of the French, there's a Swiss painter called Ferdinand Hodler, which this work resembles. I won't go into that. Um, and this kind of relationship to modernism was not recuperated in China until the 1980s. I mean, that's a fact of history. Well, who, are the, who is this other artist, near, near companion, uh, near contemporary? Um, it was, in fact, this woman, Pan Yu Liang. I'll go back and show you. Pan Yu Liang had the same teacher as um, Su Bei Hong for a certain period of time, which is now, whose name was Pascal Damien Boulay. Uh, so forth. But names sometimes like the, the insertion of the sub name. Um, and um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about the picture on the left, which I've never seen illustrated in China, is that it was owned by Xi Bei Hong. Xi Bei Hong owned this picture with his first wife. And I would I, uh, you know, just alert people who are not familiar with the complexities of Xi Bei Hong's life to the following conflict. Which is that Xi Bei Hong's first wife, who went with him to Paris up until the end of the 1930s, 1920s, I think, um, uh, um, owned this picture. And we don't see it recommended representative in, in Chinese reproduction at all. It's very difficult to know what's going on between Xi Bei Hong and his first wife, Tang Bi Wei, um, because when he remarried later, well, he had an affair with one. And then remarried after during the war with this, um, another artist, another sorry, another um, English student. Um, he um, conveniently forgot that, that all of his history about his time in Paris in the 1920s was based on Jean Biwe's memoirs, not on. Um, um, what's the name of the one? I'm sorry, I just went out. Memory space here. Yeah? Um, that point, just to, just so you know that I have actually been looking really carefully at his history. Um, I, uh, Liao Jingwen, an artist who I've interviewed, by the way, that a person I've interviewed. Um, Liao Jingwen, when he when he married Liao Jingwen, um, the whole of the previous relationship with Yang Wei was put in. Um, in bracket. Jiang Biwei was indeed, um, how can we put it, um, passionately connected to the idea of Xu Bei Hong as the representative painter of modern China and the stars with which he was associated with being what China needed. Um, and as you can see, this was not the case with the Pan Yuliang. Pan Yuliang indeed has, has got, despite having the same teacher, Pan, um, Lucien Simon and Daniel uh, uh, Bouvray was um, their common teacher. Uh, Lucien Simon was a kind of late impressionist who portrayed folk scenes and seek to. Yeah. Um, she introduced directly a kind of reformed Ecole de Paris, sort of late impressionist plus. Violent color, 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 color seems to her work, which she did in the 1940s. But she had not been around in China. She'd returned to China from a long period in France and then Italy in the 1920s. And then did this picture, which is supposed to be, I'm, I don't know, I'm no, I'm assessing claims about it, the first representation of a nude by a Chinese woman artist. And it was published in a, in a magazine in 1929. That's the only place where it survived. Here's the covering sheet on the right. And the second famous nude painting, again, from, uh, only survives in reproduction from a magazine of 1930s on the left. Um, 
She was quite widely recognized by Ecole de Paris sympathizers in Paris and produced this nude on the right in uh, 1941, which was damaged on exhibition, actually torn at 27th century tearing, um, which was found by um, the curate, the conservators at the uh, museum in um, China when the work was re returned to them. Um, and they repaired it. Well, um, we can say from looking at the reproductions of the work of Lucien and Simon that it was a, a rather um, rigid kind of um, dark tone representation of outdoor scenes associated with a particular group called uh, the Black Band, La Bande Noire. And these applied the rather frozen and academicized variant of Manny's impressions of influential French subjects, in this case, drawn from Brittany. But you can see the influence without I'm mean, tossing the eyes and crossing the T's, quite strong influence of Bonnard and Matisse in the coloring of her work. Um, artists with a certain familiarity. Um, Pan is the only modern. Chinese oil painter who may be truly regarded as Xu Beihong's peers, at least from 1930 to 1937. And she was also a sculptor of some ability. But after 1937, her surviving work, was, which continued until 1977 when she died, was returned to China. It's clearly within a kind of Kies van Dongen sort of Pascal. Called a mannerism of the mid 20th century. And this uh, can, to some extent, be associated with her teacher, Lucien Simon, uh, Simon. But it's also interestingly to, interesting to note that Lucien Simon was also the teacher of Amrita Chagil, although she was later, and they weren't in school at the same time. Um, Amrita Chagil went to the Ecole uh, Nationale des Beaux Arts. Um, from 1930s to 1933, when, uh, when Pan Yuliang was already back in China. Um, but there's, an, there's a kind of a crossover there, which we can, could be a further discussion. Um, the interesting thing about her work is that she turns a Chinese nude, or the nude by a, a female nude by a woman, into her subject matter, which you see in some pictures. And also um, a black servant who she uh, seemed to have turned into a kind of companion um, with, with uh, the, allied with a technique which in some works, not necessarily all of them, but in some works, was also linked with a dotting technique which you could think of as Chinese um, late Ming painting, early Qing painting. Um, she obviously is aware of it, but you'll notice that these women have lost their nose. And there's quite a lot of these nudes without a nose. Um, I'm keeping back the information which all of you presumably expect me to discuss at some length, which is that Pan Yuliang actually, it seems, been sold into a brothel as a child and was bought out of it by a person who's a high official of the nationalist government. And she was a, um, their relationship, Pan Zhang Hua, was, was um, uh, greatly supported by Chen Duxiu, who was the, one of the founders of the Chinese Communist Party. So while she was at the art school in Shanghai, she um, began to move in a circle which was described as reformist, republican, and then progressivist or politically progressivist with this Chen Shu uh, were recognizing their relationship with um, this former official who bought her out of her contract as a prostitute. And that may have led to physical problems later in life, we, I don't know. But um, she didn't show her nose because she'd been occupied, she'd been operated on her nose three times by the end of the 1940s. Um, and she may not have wanted to show it. 
despite Tulip Panyuliang's continuous desire to return to China and her sympathy with um, Soviet communism, there is a reference in all of the biographical material about Panyuliang that she went to, to Russia um, during the Second World War, but the dates don't really cohere properly. And I don't know whether they're just hearsay reporting the fact that her work had been illustrated in the Soviet magazine, um, or that she actually did go uh, to the Soviet Union in 1914. Uh, um, it, it would have been very difficult for her to go from Paris to Moscow. But anyway, that's what one of the sources says. Um, in, Artists don't exist in a uh, some kind of um, ideological pure vacuum. They don't go in at one space and breathe out at the other. Pan um, Yuliang was very, very close to Zhang Dachian, um, who might be regarded as a conservative ink painter. And Zhang Dachian she'd known since the time when she'd been a teacher at Nanjing in 1930. And they used to sing Beijing opera together. Uh, and then after the Second World War, she'd known, she knew Zhang Dachian when he came to France and went with him to London on a visit to London. So um, the notion of China, which, or what was Chinese form, which she may have supported, was by no means uh, a monochromatic one, not, not a monodimensional one. Um, artists have to be left with and you, this kind of broad mindedness and uh, open relationship to Chinese form. Um, is found among other modernist artists um, in, in France. Um, there's no big history paintings, like, of course, this one. When I say history paintings, these are, of course, allegoristic reconstructions of something that didn't take place. Uh, we can compare with Chi Bei Hong, we can compare their self-portraits, which are much more obviously comparable. Um, and she, it seems that Pan Yuliao really hadn't got much time for um, the intellectual grievers over modern China's fate, which you find in Xi Um She was interested in establishing a new kind of Chinese painting. She was interested in her family, but she was also interested in herself, in her being a person, recognized as a person. There, someone has made the assumptions that the book that she's holding in the picture on the right is a little red book around 1966, rather than just simply a convenient thing to hold uh, uh, when she's re reworking a mode of self-portraiture she'd, she'd done in 1930. Um, I, I really don't have an opinion either way, but it's very interesting that um, this painting should continue, I'm gonna jump here, um, in a way that, um, the self-portrait became a kind of dominant motif of hers. It's always assumed by Chinese sources, they always mention it, that um, she wanted to return to China and she did indeed, according to the surviving letters, want to return to China, but I'm not sure about that. Because if you look at this woman's body on the left in this inquisitive, uh, but also a rather skeptical face on the right. Um, you could see that for her, artistic freedom, having been badly treated in China as a child and as, as an adolescent, and having been having had her work roundly destroyed by right-wing thugs in the 1930s in one exhibition. Um, you could see that for her, artistic freedom might have meant being outside China. This is the, the gap. She's not really discussed in Chinese sources because of 
that she's trying, they're trying to recuperate her as a national hero, feminine uh, success story in, in Europe, when she might have been that in a certain way of interpretation. But um, she may also have thought that she didn't want to return to China because as an artist, her real freedom had been gained outside of her recognition and the ability, just simply the ability to paint and to finance her painting, as it seems, by various kinds of um, uh, embroidery and other kinds of you know, uh, millinery skills and so forth. Um, that she didn't, she wanted to be her per herself. Um, and she was allowed to be that outside um, China. Home, she hadn't. She had to play all these role games about being another person who showed the naked body, female body, or a son Jonia, a person who would not marry her, but supported her out of the brothel with his son, who was. Um, by another, by his own, another wife. Uh, because this is an important, but um, nevertheless minor wife. Um, there's all sorts of things going on in these pictures of the 1930s, um, which perhaps we don't have the right material to resolve. I think she wanted to stay outside. But just me leaving those pictures out for a moment. I think she didn't want to be engaged in, in the allegory of nationalism, even though she was a staunch patriot. She wanted to be herself. And this is how she managed to do it in Paris, at which point. Um, in the story, others to interrogate.